Uh, this stuff is not quite as easy. So notebook page 40 is about how certain scientific and philosophical ideas affected um, how people viewed the world and acted in it. So I want to do a quick overview, like a little timeline overview of it, and then I'll talk about them kind of in chronological order. -ish. So if we start at about 1815, and we go all the way to about 1914, which is the end of this period, uh, we have two sort of starting slash bleed over uh, major philosophical motivations for people. What's one of them? Yeah, enlightenment thought, right. And that's gonna, of course, turn into liberalism. Uh, and you could say liberalism. And that's gonna uh, be extremely influential all the way up to about the mid point here, about 1850-ish. And then it's gonna become slightly less relevant, but it does continue onward. But there's something else that gets really popular here and presses forward and makes things a lot more violent. It's very counter-enlightenment. Yeah, the nationalist uh, romantic movement, right? Specifically the nationalism part. So we also have, starting here, a much more damaging uh, nationalism that picks up um, an intensity here. All right, so nationalism. And that's going to continue, and it's going to even morph into imperialism in the latter half here, in like the 1870s and 1880s and 90s. All right, so here, here's what I want to focus on is, first of all, how these ideas, we're in the nationalism, we talked plenty about that, how these ideas affected people's views besides the abolition movement, which we know about. Um, and then also, why all of a sudden people started justifying or wanting to engage in imperialism. Because right? there's a reason why this pops up when it does. All right? There's a technological reason, which we already know about the Second Industrial Revolution, but there's also a philosophical or scientific reason too, well, pseudo-scientific reason, why they do that. So let's focus here for a second on um, how people viewed humans with this enlightenment slash liberal phase going on here and how that might affect culture. So we already know one, the abolition movement's a big one. Obviously wiping out slavery is a, is a, a noble cause. We have, before I hand, I guess you, we have um, uh, the desire for equal opportunity and we see suffrage expanding. Suffrage. All right, but what else? What are you going for here? Um, the cultural revolution. Cultural revolution? Yeah, like Mao, Mao's China. We're talking about the 1960s. Where oh, he sorry. Wipes. sorry. Um, I'm talking about, like, people... Cultural something um, that starts with an R. Okay, you can describe it. Um, it's basically where people begin to appreciate other cultures, like the Geno's Aries and all that. Yeah, okay. So that's called cultural relativism. Sorry, all of you hands that were up. Cultural relativism, that's where you are. Oh, I forgot my sheet. Uh, that's where you, now no one uh, really thought that Europe wasn't at the time, Western society wasn't uh, the most advanced or best. And it kind of was, at least technologically and economically. Um, but it didn't make them view the world condescendingly, I guess is how you can phrase it. Um, they realized that, yeah, Western civilization was ahead, at least in several major categories, but they still appreciated the contributions and knowledge and accomplishments of other cultures. Uh, and they also believed everyone else was capable of learning that as well. They didn't think like, oh, it's just because Europeans are superior and these people can't learn this stuff. They, most of them had some inkling of believing that other people were capable of that too. They just had to share the info. And they wanted to gather all the info too, all right? So that's cultural relativism. That's an important set of beliefs. That's one that we should stick to. It does exist to this day. So all cultures are not equal as far as how advanced they are, but all people slash cultures capable uh, of progress. And again, they define progress as less human suffering, more human flourishing. All right, so just because China or India or Africa was behind, didn't mean that they thought they were inferior, they just thought that you know they happened to be behind culturally for whatever reason and they could also learn and, and catch up as well. So they also started to, and this is gonna really impact the abolition movement, they started seeing people as equal as far as they should have their natural rights, so they should not be slaves obviously, they should be given equal opportunity. What was that idea of even though we might look different and have different cultures, we are relatively similar and or equal? 
Enlightenment universalism? Yeah, enlightenment universalism, or sometimes we would call this human sameness too. Uh, oh, both of those would work. So enlightenment universalism. Uh, it's the concept of human sameness. Yeah, we might look different and have different cultures, but we are all humans, and we are capable of improvement and should be allowed uh, to do so. So those are really important motivations going forward. And that's obviously going to spur on the abolition movement, this equal opportunity uh, suffrage movement where they expand um, you know, voting rights, uh, where middle class uh, uh, women and other people that become more wealthy and have more leisure time start trying to, like, What's the word I'm looking for? Aid the deserving poor, right, with, with, with charity programs and Sunday schools, and then they're misguided but morally, I guess, virtuous uh, temperance where they wanted to eliminate alcohol and alcoholism. Uh, that's a large reason why. Okay, so any questions about that? All right, cool. So why then does, besides the fact that, yes, nationalism is also going concurrently, and is very much the opposite of this, because that says my people are superior to yours and we're gonna show it by force if necessary. What's one of the two major reasons why these ideals begin to give way and people shift from learning and helping others to exploiting them and or conquering them? Social Darwinism. Okay, but first, before social Darwinism we have. The Darwinism. Darwinism, okay, cool. So the reason why this occurs when it does is we have Darwinism, which doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily like evil or bad. It's a scientific explanation for the world as to how it exists. But people sort of co-opt this, like Herbert Spencer and a few others, uh, and apply it to society. And this is where uh, you have the imperialism uh, perking up, is social Darwinism. All right, let's talk about the Darwinism first, then. Darwinism. All right, obviously Charles Darwin is the... Uh, Inventor, and somebody tell me uh, what his book was and um, what it meant, essentially. Um, the book was The Origin of Species, yep. and, it, and it said that... Um, that was 1959, or 1859, right? Is that the year? Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, and it um, explained that evolution occurred because of the natural selection where it's the survival of the fittest, so the stronger genes get passed on from generation to generation. Yeah, so you have... Uh, it, it offers a natural biological explanation for the world and why it's so varied, right? Because there's a bunch of different species, correct? So what were all the explanations for like these millions of different, or thousands of different species before? How did they, how did people think they existed differently? God put them in. Yeah, like God like created them as they were. But there are several things that are going to um, uh, break that view, uh, at least scientifically. So you are correct uh, that it is, provides a natural slash biological explanation for existence as well as a variety. And it also asserts, and you mentioned this too, some evolutionary traits are better than others, right? So if I'm born and my genes allow me to uh, keep myself alive and spread my genes and keep my, my, my kin alive, that I'm more likely to uh, pass that trait on. The other traits will die off and I might have an uh, the development of what later becomes another species, you know, something along those lines. All right, um, so natural selection uh, or survival of the fittest. Can somebody give me an example of natural selection or survival of the fittest? Like a specific example where we know this happened, so then these things died off, but those ones kept going. Anybody know a specific example? Well, here we are. We got here somehow. The people that were immune to the measles, and then they went over to the new world. And then they oh, that's actually a good example, a tragic one, but a good one, yeah. That would be an example of uh, survival of the fittest. And again, that doesn't mean that the Native Americans were like inferior, but since they weren't exposed to generations of, uh, of resistance to old world diseases, when we showed up, they got wiped out and, and replaced. All right, cool. And so sometimes by force, but mostly it was accidentally and unknowingly passing on these diseases that just <coughs> wipe them out because they had no immunity. So that is a good example of one here on the human scale. Uh, Homo sapiens outliving the Homo erectus. Yeah, and Neanderthals too, by the way. Yeah, that, that's a great example uh, as well. So because we had these evolutionary uh, mutations that allowed us to be smarter uh, and think about things and plan, that gave us a huge advantage 
over over others. The, uh, there's a lot of things. There's probably three major things that gave us a big enough advantage to expand beyond the forests and conquer the world, essentially. It was sweating. It was, hold on, I'll explain that in a minute. She's like, why is sweating on that list? <laughs> there's sweating. There's um, our long legs compared to other primates. And what's the other one? Oh, language. Those three are the uh, biggest reasons why humans were able to spread out and just absolutely devastate everybody else. So um, the sweat thing, let me explain that just for funsies. So sweating is like, if this was a video game, it'd be like a totally OP hack because sweating allows us to, do you know it? Um, sweating allows us to cool down and have extra stamina. So like when, Back then, when we were hunting, we could actually um, outrun. Well, not outrun, but we could outchase. Outrun, yeah, outchase uh, um, the anything. Bird. Actually, yeah. yeah. So uh, we we found this mutation hack where we traded fur for sweating ability. So most animals, if they're running and they, they start overheating to cool down, they have to pant. They have to stop and do that. Like they can't sweat. That's why dogs run and they'll lay go, oh, like, and all, all animals do that. <laughs> That's the only way they can cool down. They don't sweat. Humans sweat though. So we actually have a totally almost cheat advantage to where when we're running and we sweat, that actually cools us down. So the movement that we're uh, participating in hits that you know sweat we've projected and then it actually cools us down. So us running actually slowly keeps our stamina up. Like not entirely, but enough to keep going. So all we had to do was say, oh look, there's a big deer or, or anything. Oh, let's just chase it. So you run away and then you can't catch the deer. It just goes and it runs off. So, but then you just keep chasing the deer. So you just turn it not into a sprint, but a marathon. So then you and your buddies, usually like three or four guys or whatever, uh, with your spears, you just go, oh, there's some deer, and you just start chasing it, and then it runs away, and you see it go off, and then you kind of, if it, if it goes out of your vision, you just kind of track it, where it's going, oh, there it is resting, you just run after it again, oh, it has to get up again and run, and it does that to the point that it actually overheats and its muscles don't work anymore, and then the humans just come up and go, all right, and then they get it, and then they take it back. So it could take a while, a few miles, but uh, that was a huge, huge, huge hack that humans were able to take advantage of uh, because of that mutation. So because of that, we could chase down anything for the most part. Um, also, the language thing, for the first time, we could actually form intricate communication and coordination. So like there are animals that work together kind of like intuitively, but we can actually plan things. Be like, all right, you go here and do this at this time, and I'll go here and do this at this time. Uh, and we can actually specifically plan, or we can explain things like, oh, I found this, these types of fruit over in this one valley. If we all go there, you know, it'll help out our plan or whatever. And you go there, oh, look, I figured out how to actually plant these things. You know, we can share information, uh, which is a massive advantage. And the last one, uh, because we developed longer legs, which is, you know, better for the long distance running as well, than our um, other great ape slash primate ancestors, we can throw things. Uh, really well, far, and powerfully. So like chimps and other animals, other uh, great apes can throw things, like they can pick up a rock and toss it. But since their legs are so short, they can't do it well. Uh, for us to actually like throw something with a lot of accuracy and power, you actually have to have long legs to balance yourself because you have to kind of like, uh, well, I don't know the physics behind all the terminology, but you're, you're kind of like your own, own lever slash trebuchet because you're able to lean in and, and put power behind it and throw it accurately. If you had short legs, you would just be like, <clears throat> you wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> so because humans can uniquely, you know, go and put uh, a lot of power and accuracy to their throws, they're able to, first of all, develop the concept of a projectile, like a stick with a sharp or a sharpened stick, and then actually throw it uh, a long distance. And if they figure out a better way to make the stick, like adding those things, I can't remember what they're called, to the end of them that make them go further and more accurately, they can share that information with others because they have the language. So that's what got us out of that um, survival or what's the word I'm looking for? Natural competition with other animals. And once we got that, it was, it was GG. We just <laughs> spread all over the place. Because we could take down anything. In fact, we wiped out entire species way before we even had state systems or technology beyond just sharpened sticks. Like we caused the woolly mammoth to go out of, uh, uh, to become extinct and the woolly rhino, all these big mammals, because we could plan. We just chase them and or surround them and like cause them to fall off cliffs and nasty stuff like that. And that's, we just ran them to extinction. So those are excellent examples of, of natural selection and survival. But it's probably way more in depth than you needed, but hell, it's interesting.
Now you're gonna like walk right, walk right to like, the only thing I remember about my history class was that human beings sweat, and that was why we're all here. But hey, I'll take it. Um, the other one too is natural selection. Could all of these species be here if the earth was only 6,000 years old? No, why not? It takes a long time. Yeah, so uh, some people call it big time. Uh, we like to call it the geologic time because this is the reason why, uh, and this is also a new idea of the time, the tremendously larger than we expected scale uh, of time, like millions and billions of years if you're talking planetary. Um, and then for life, certainly millions of years, like hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and then in the case of Homo sapiens, a couple hundred thousand years. Uh, geological time <coughs> explained uh, this development. And uh, they actually found a lot of evidence for this. There, there were some observations Darwin made about like certain species that would, you know, uh, like those, uh, those, those Galapagos uh, birds with the bigger beaks surviving whereas the smaller beak ones didn't survive because of the drought, because they couldn't crack the nuts or whatever it was. And they also did the one with the moths, that when London got all smoggy from the Industrial Revolution, moths that were like this grayish brown color uh, were harder to spot by birds. So like all the non-gray brown moths got like wiped out, but the gray and brown moths multiplied because they could hide better in the smoggy um, setting. Uh, so there's examples on small scale like that, but how could I actually prove a lot of this geological natural selection stuff in other ways? Like showing like, oh look, here are some things that are thousands of years old, and here are some creatures we've never even seen, and there's a bunch of them. Uh, find, like, finding old remains in this. Yep, archaeological findings, right? Some of the first ones were easy ones, like when you had tectonic activity, and then like, you know, uh, like in Africa, for example, the, um, I don't have Africa up here but that uh, rift valley or whatever it's called, that's actually slowly breaking off, like where Somalia and Kenya and all those are, the Horn of Africa, it's actually slowly doing this, and it's eventually gonna break off completely from Africa. Um, when areas like that are, 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 when stuff like that's occurring, you actually have the whole like shelf plate moving. You can actually see the layers without having to dig. Like we can dig, obviously, but you know, in the 1800s, early 1800s, people were like, oh, let's dig at a one mile hole just to see what happens. Uh, they might have come across stuff when they were mining, but I doubt miners cared very much about that. But yeah, you could actually see it in some areas like the Grand Canyon. You can see it really well where the river's worn down a lot of layers and you can go and see all the, the, the strata of different sedentary layers and you can see fossils in it and, and whatnot. So they actually found a lot of evidence for this just laying around in the dirt uh, as well. Uh, so that backed a lot of their theories. Okay, that's wonderful. That gives us a nice biological explanation for things and gives us a nice scale to, to allow that to happen. Obviously, another topic is how religious people were resistant to this idea, and even still are, but uh, that's not what we're concerned about in this class. What we are concerned about is how was this co-opted incorrectly to equal justifying imperialism and nationalist expansion? That's what I'm wanna, I want to know. Because uh, Europeans were so much more technologically developed, they thought they were better than any non-Euros who weren't as developed, so they used that as just justification for exploiting them. Also yes, exactly. Okay, cool. So, good explanation. Um, what they did was they co-opted this idea and applied it to themselves. Uh, as individuals in society, like if you're the middle class as opposed to the working class, but as well on, on civilization levels, like that Europeans uh, were superior. So, uh, and this wasn't a particular favorite of Darwin, although he did have a book called The, the uh, Descent of Man, where he talked about how inevitably the aboriginals would be wiped out by superior civilizations. He didn't necessarily condone genocide, but uh, a guy named Herbert Spencer and others kind of do, at least more explicitly. Uh, they're the ones that advocate the idea, uh, idea of <coughs> European or Western, I guess you could say, we'll just say European, European superiority. And I don't mean like our culture's more advanced. Uh, everyone would agree with that back then as far as technologically and economically and life uh, expectancy, living standards, all that stuff. But he's actually saying, no, no, no. The people are superior, like genetically. Like we have bigger brains or uh, better mechanisms for uh, uh, you know, s survival. And that's why we're ahead of all these other places across the world. Uh, and even more so than that, 
if I believe in evolution and then I co-opt this pseudoscientific misapplication of it and, and assume that that means I'm superior to other people of the world, what does that do with the idea that I can go and conquer them? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? It's the good thing. Oh it's the right thing. It's Why? It's good to conquer them because um, you're, 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 they, if they believe they're genetically superior, they're going to bring, well, basically, those superior traits to the people. Yep. So they uh, incorrectly moralized and justified uh, <coughs> imperial conquest. Uh, as them bringing civilization to others, uh, but also this, they saw it as a natural process because I mean, natural selection, it happens on its own. Um, so what they believed was, and this is kind of what natural selection does, it does test you against nature to see which uh, um, organisms can live and thrive. So to them, they believe it's a natural process and it's actually a moral one that by allowing the, the strong or better fit to survive, to dominate the weak and wipe them out or control them. It's actually a natural process that will make the world better. All right, so they didn't even just believe it was okay. They actually thought incorrectly that it was morally, uh, uh, a morally virtuous endeavor to do so. Like, that's what we should do. And in fact, stopping that process was actually a bad thing. So if I was middle class and I would go out to like aid the poor and give them money or, or divert more taxes for, for poor relief, why might they think that was a bad thing? Because they actually did. They didn't just think like, oh, I don't want to get my money up, although they did think that. But they actually thought it was an immoral action to do that. Exactly. They thought of it uh, along these lines, that you're actually uh, continuing a, an inferior set of genes or population by doing that. So not only did they think, don't take my money, which they did, but they also thought it was actually an immoral, unnatural process to do so. It was like, they suck because they suck. Uh, because their genes suck. They thought that they were stupid or lazy or that their civilizations were inferior. Uh, and again, that even applied to the Europeans, whether it was Eastern and Southern Europe or working class people in Germany or England or France. They're like, they're there because they suck. If they were smart and able, they would go out and invent something, do something great and make their way to the middle class on their own. All right. Uh, and especially back then, we know that's not true because women couldn't do that because they were limited, right? Uh, working class people were limited largely in what they could or couldn't do. So it wasn't really an accurate description of what was going on. There were definitely a lot of social limitations that made that not possible, but they didn't share this idea of human sameness and cultural relativism. They believed that, no, there are inferior people and we shouldn't help them, and if you do help them, you're going against the natural process. It's a good thing to let the weak perish and let the strong survive, whether that meant rich middle-class people in Europe or it meant European civilization across the world. All right, so that's why uh, they're going to be okay with imperial conquest. Why are they okay with war between Europeans then? Because they're also very pro-European wars too, right? So they, they, don't, they, they don't care about the poor in Europe, and they don't care about the other civilizations. But they're also okay with going head-to-head -head and duking it out as far as armies go. Why? why? Because the better traits survive. Yeah, they saw it as, a, as a, a natural selection test on a civilization level. Right? That's what Hitler's whole goal was going to World War II was promote the German race and exterminate and push out all inferior races uh, to the point that he was actually genocidally murdering you know, millions of people. All right? uh, so this is going to spiral out of control and ultimately end with you know, the most vile example of, of the Holocaust. All right? But do we understand how, this is what you need to understand, can you understand how people can go from thinking the, along these lines about human sameness and relativism to all of a sudden learning about these scientific ideas which are true and good and wonderful but then they misinterpret them or misapply them to totally reverse this to go from we're all the same we're all capable to no 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 we're not and we shouldn't help out people that are inferior because it's unnatural does that make sense to you hopefully okay good i hope that does um and that does a good job of explaining how none of this well this can be enlightenment none of this uh, and this is uh, anywhere near enlightenment. It's all counter-enlightenment. And when people connect it to the enlightenment, they're doing so improperly. Um, they, are, uh, they are making a historical or philosophical error. All right, we get on Darwinism, social Darwinism? Sweet, just uh, positivism. But before I do that, I want to actually uh, give you our current explanation as to why Europeans actually do better. Have I ever done this? Have I told you about this specifically? 
about why Europe, this, this is a really good explanation for why Europe uh, ended up doing better faster. Okay, good, I have it. All right, um, let me quickly draw the world, really small anyway. All right, so here's uh, the Americas. It's not gonna be good, obviously, but you'll get the picture. All right, Americas, Greenland, Iceland, Europe here. Oops. Sorry, Africa. Okay, I promise I do this all for a reason. Okay, if you look historically, where do I find all of my most highly developed state systems? Ones that uh, really grew, had a lot of good ideas, technologies, expanded their populations, and generally conquered um, other people. Uh, and it's not just Europe, by the way, Europe is one of them, but it's not just Europe. Are you doing the Middle East? Yeah, okay, cool. So we've got uh, the Middle East. Fair enough. All right, and that would include part of North Africa because that's where they got to, and you had the Egyptians there as well. So we've got this region and this region. Just casting to see this region. All right, what are the regions we got? China. Yeah, East Asia for sure. Definitely, most notably China. I got to catch up on this. I missed a couple of you, Andre. All right. Yeah, we got uh, East Asia for sure. Right, that's including China, uh, and you could even say Japan certainly. All right, where else do we have some successful civilizations that get developed and thrive? North America. Uh, North America, let's say before the, the uh, Industrial Revolution. Before the Industrial Revolution, so pre-1750. Pre because you, you wouldn't be able to include the Americas there. And then Russia. Okay, uh, yeah, so let, let me just include Europe there. Europe. Uh, there's one we're missing, I think. Asia? Yeah, the South Asia region. Okay, cool. Not as much, but still kind of. Uh, this region, Southeast Asia, the Indonesian Archipelago, not Oceania, not Sub-Saharan Africa, not, I, I realize you have the Incans, but they didn't have things like the wheel and language and things like that. And when the Spanish came over, they didn't have anywhere near their technology. Although, uh, for this civilization, they were uh, rather far advanced. Why do I put North America? In North America, not either. Uh, you do have some uh, awesome Mayan and uh, Mesoamerican civilizations, but nowhere near what uh, these civilizations were able to accomplish. Okay, looking at the map, why do you think that is? It's not genes, we know that. We are well aware that if you take anybody from any of these populations and put them into a culture that has a stable economy uh, and education, they do equally well. Like their IQ catches right up to everybody else, no problem. They are, okay, that's a huge reason why. All of these other areas are isolated by ge geographical barriers, right? What's blocking this off from the rest of the world? Yeah, the Saharan Desert's a major one, right? So I've got a big cutoff here. So this area gets uh, cut off from the rest of the world. Okay, this area does too because oh, it's just so cold, nobody goes up here. Um, what about these areas here? Why are they cut off from the rest of the world largely? Or at least they're not introduced till much later. Yeah, exactly. Water. We got, and also you have a, a major forest barrier here, too. So whether it's uh, water uh, or forest, they're largely cut off as well from the rest of the world. Okay, what about over here? They have they have two continents connected. I don't understand. Why are they? Because of the, the, they didn't know the Americas over there. Or That's true. So they're, they they are they on their own the set of continents. But what was the last part you said? They're going to fall off the edge of the world. I don't know that they thought that. The Europeans. Yeah, okay. So fair enough, they're not connected to the this set of civilizations too, but they have two whole continents together. Like that's a smallish area. That's, these are small areas. This is a lot of territory. Why, why didn't they become as advanced um, as the other civilizations? Granted, some Mesoamerican Incans were pretty advanced, not like these civilizations were. That does make it more difficult. So you have like things like the Rocky Mountains and the Andes Mountains. That's a big factor, and then a giant rainforest here. That's a big factor. Uh, this was the one that what I probably wouldn't have figured out if I didn't hear it from somebody else. Uh, I was 
say the entire Atlantic Ocean is just separate. It is, yeah, that's what the BD got. And, you, and you're right, okay. So, oh, what you got? Uh, central bureaucracy. They end up in developing a central bureaucracy. They did later, but it did take them a long time. It was too late. By the time they just developed that, we already had Europeans coming over, right? Really, you could even argue the Incans were the only ones that did that because the Aztecs were kind of a feudal tribute state society, empire. Language barrier? Language barrier? Uh, we had that over here too. There's like some type of vernacular being developed in Europe at least. Th there was here too as well, just not in the writing system. Uh, as far as verbally, there was. Is the amount of population Not necessarily, because we have large populations here. All right, I'll give it to you. This is a hard one. Um, so obviously a good answer for why these ones were all more advanced was they're connected, right? So I have, uh, I mean, what's most of this right here? Silver. What kind of land is it? Uh, flat. Yeah, you're right, the silk goes over. Yeah, it's mostly flat grassland. Can I go across it pretty easily? Yeah. 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 So uh, Europe is easily connected uh, with all of Asia for the most part. And I do have the Himalayas here, and I have a desert here. But, I mean, there's ways to go between them relatively easy uh, or around them. So all of these areas are very easily connected. Mediterranean, too. I could just sail along the Mediterranean or walk along it fairly easily, and the climate's good. So all these areas are pretty damn interconnected. So when one civilization comes up with something good, um, what happens? Does it stay there, never get, it ends up spreading, right? So people are able to share ideas and knowledge. Sure, they might be conquered by each other, and they were, uh, but along with that conquest would come ideas about how to structure a government or an economy or technology, things along those lines. So you have thousands of years of uh, these civilizations all exchanging ideas, but unfortunately for these ones, they're not going to exchange as many ideas. And again, a lot of that's because of geography. I can move around these continents much more easily, whether it's by using waterways and rivers or by the steppe regions. A lot of ideas and conquest and people uh, at exchange. Also disease too, as we know. Uh, that's why they were so resistant to so many. Uh, and here's why these continents didn't develop at the same rate. Even though there's a lot of territory, um, what's the orientation here? North, south, or east, west? North, south. North, south. That's actually the reason why a lot of these ideas don't spread. So is this stretch of land relatively similar as far as climate goes? Yes. It is, right? There's not a whole lot of north-south. It, it, I mean, the Earth spins uh, east-west, so you're getting the same climate for the most part. So if I've got horses over here, can they also live over here? Yeah, yeah they definitely can easily. Uh, same thing with pigs and sheep and all kinds of domesticated animals. So first of all, domesticated animals, uh, can be transferred across these civilizations. So uh, I've got people that can easily move and ideas and animals uh, that can go easily across. And they, they translate well because the climate's pretty close across this whole area because it's the same uh, latitude. Not the case here, all right? Animals that live uh, in this region cannot live in this region. And animals that live in this region cannot live in this region or that region or that region. These are all regions that are kind of cut off based on temperature. This is too cold for any of these animals. Uh, this is too hot for any of these animals, uh, and vice versa. So I can't really travel or bring things across. So I don't get domesticate animals. People don't move along those lines as well for the exact same reason. Because if I have a lot of skills in uh, eating whale blubber and seals, it doesn't really translate to uh, living in the plains uh, or in the Appalachian Mountains, which also doesn't translate well to living in the tropical regions. So. Geography is largely the reason why the civilizations out of this Eurasian network uh, were so far behind. Not because the humans there were stupider or inferior. They're not. We know that. Once you take anyone from these areas and bring them to a stable, educated state, they do just fine. Like After like one generation even. You can have immigrants coming from uh, a developing country. And sure, the, the parents probably aren't going to do super awesome, but their kids do. And certainly their kids' kids do and they catch up as soon as they assimilate into these societies. The reason why they think Europe took off so fast is just luck, because you have all these ideas and technologies being exchanged, but it just so happened that uh, here in England, they randomly divided, uh, devised the idea of individualism and private property, uh, and then also they have access uh, to the Atlantic Ocean, which allows them to get resources from here, uh, and that's just a uh, chance. Anytime those ideas have spread to places like Japan, China, Singapore, uh, 
South Africa, or some other states that are successful outside of there. Uh, India, increasingly, uh, uh, Australia, wherever it might be, or uh, Englishmen that come over here, or Frenchmen that come over here, or Germans. They bring those ideas with them. It doesn't matter what cultural people they are. Once they adopt them, they take off. That's why China, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, all these other places uh, went from not even 80 years ago being way behind, well, except for Japan, uh, being way, 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 way behind. And now they're, they're like, they're pretty much, they either are almost caught up or they're caught up with the West as far as life expectancy and quality of living and stuff like that. So where the social Darwinists screwed up all the way up to, you know, Hitler, was they thought that race was the reason, but really it's geography. These uh, civilizations did way better than the others because they were interconnected and they could move along and share ideas much more easily. And then by chance, uh, Western Europe happened to stumble on these universal ideas about how to do well with an economy and a, and a political system. Uh, but that was just chance. So you guys got that? So if anybody goes barking on about how certain races or cultures appear, you can just slap them with some knowledge and be like, nope, it's even easier than that. It's actually geography. Uh, that's why these were all a bit behind and these were a bit ahead, but any humans can adopt these ideas and do just fine. So we got that? Yes. All right, cool. <clears throat> it's also nice too, because now you can be less afraid about uh, biological explanations uh, for things like genetics. Because everybody was so afraid to say genes had any impact on your behavior or ability because they were afraid that people were just going to go the Hitler route. But we don't have to now. Now we know that there's a Individual variants, but it doesn't matter. We're all capable if we have the ideas that are shared.